Okay, so welcome back everyone to DSE 102. Um, it's a pleasure to have with us uh, Lavanya Shukla, head of growth at uh, one of the pioneering companies in the MLOP space, weights and biases. And Lavanya has been a kind of a leader in this space, steering ML weights and biases towards um, adding new capabilities for reproducibility and debugging and tracking of uh, machine learning and deep learning experiments. And uh, it's one of the industry standard experiment tracking platforms. And that's growing as model governance and end-to-end -end life cycle governance is becoming more of a concern in the ML world and industry. Lavanya began working in AI 10 years ago when she founded uh, ACM SIG AI at Purdue University as a sophomore. That's awesome. In a past life, she taught herself to code at age 10. So you taught yourself, that's incredible. And founded the machine learning startup Data Land. So it's great to have you here with us, Lavanya. I think I learned my machine learning first and foremost only in my last year of college. <laughs> it's amazing how the world has evolved. Great. There uh, was no so, age back when I went to school in 2000, like I uh, went there in 2007, there were no AI courses. There was like robotics and stuff, you know, that was our AI. Okay. Well, uh, great to have you here. So protocol, Students, if you have any questions, uh, you can enter it on the chat. I will be monitoring the chat. You could also raise your hand. And Lavanya, would you want to take questions in between or want to keep it till the end? I would love to take it in the middle. Uh, so it's not like just me talking at you guys and it's more of a conversation. Sounds great. Okay, so I will also monitor the chat for you. And if there are questions, I will ask you to pause at some part after you're done with your slide. Okay, I'll take it away. Okay. Next. And I just realized I want to share just the tab, not the whole thing. So let me switch that. Can you guys see the um, screen? Yeah, we can see your, your Google Slides. All right, let's get started. Still see the slides? Cool. Uh, so uh, today I'll be talking about reproducible machine learning at scale. Before I get in um, to the talk itself, um, I used to be a machine learning engineer. Now I run growth. Um, growth is an exciting department at some startups. Um, the founder of Quora, uh, Adam D'Angelo, started as the head of growth at Facebook. So if you guys have any questions about growth in general and what careers there look like, happy to answer those as well. I lead a team of 30 people and most of them are machine learning engineers. So that is one of the jobs that is available to you guys if you don't want to be researchers. But um, with that, let's get to the topic at hand. Uh, so today we're going to touch on how to understand and debug your models, and we're going to do that by understanding how you can make them reproducible, why that's important, and <clears throat> how you can visualize the outputs of your model and also the pipelines. So before we get into the fun stuff, let's talk about why uh, we need to make our models uh, reproducible. Um, and this might be obvious to a lot of you guys, but when I first started training models, uh, I was horrified to know that uh, training the same model with the same hyperparameters doesn't always lead to the same results in the same models. Um, and as you can imagine, if you're training models uh, if, to put in production, this is a huge problem. And there's a couple of reasons why um, your models are not reproducible, even if you're training the same model again and again. Um, so um, first of all, if you have a data set and you shuffle it, um, if the order that the model sees your predictions in is different, then the learnings of the model will be slightly different. Also, if the hardware, um, because of the way uh, GPUs handle floating points, um, the same operation can have different results depending on the order of computations. Um, also, machine learning libraries are constantly getting updated, GPU drivers are constantly getting updated, and these subtle behavior changes can make it so that the end result of your model is slightly different. Also, uh, if you initialize your model with different weights, or if you use dropout, you um, also introduce randomness in model training. So this becomes a problem, like I said, when you're training models for the real world. So let's just run through an example. Um, um, uh, actually, um, before we run through the example, the, this um, disparity in uh, model outputs, it becomes even more important if you have a model that decides who gets a loan, who gets indicted, 
who's considered trustworthy, who gets a job. So like the bigger and the more impactful the decision uh, that your model is influencing, the more important it is that it makes the same decision every single time you query it. Um, and one good example of it is if you are a machine learning engineer working for a, a self-driving team and God forbid the car crashes, um, your boss and the regulators are going to come and ask you, why did the car crash? And this is not a simple question to answer uh, because you need to know every single thing that goes into that model. So it could be because you didn't collect enough data samples of that particular way that that um, car uh, was positioned, you know, so you need, um, uh, and like uh, the lack of uh, the right kind of training data uh, triggers an incorrect prediction. Or it could be because um, you picked a model that over-indexes on detecting sidewalks instead of like uh, streetlights and like uh, you crash into a streetlight, you know? So we need to be able to look at both what data uh, your model was trained on and what specific characteristics of the model that you picked were. And um, if we don't, um, if we don't both track the entire model uh, training pipeline and um, also uh, if we can't reproduce it, then lives can be lost. And also for other applications that are, that are not self-driving, huge business value can be lost. So where do we start uh, in making our models reproducible? So Joelle Pino, who some of you might know, she's the reproducibility chair for NeurIPS. Um, she um, has this famous paper on improving uh, reproducibility for ML research. And she talks about <clears throat> these are some of the things that create this reproducibility gap. And uh, right now, you guys are probably working with very sanitized data sets. You're given exactly the data set that you um, need to train the model in the real world. Things are dire. Uh, you don't always have the training data for uh, the model that you're trying to reproduce, or you might not even have the code for the model, you might just have a couple lines and a couple hyperparameter values, but not all of them. Uh, they might not um, give you results that are statistically significant, so you can actually trust the results being reported for a model. Or people might be selectively uh, over uh, claiming results just to get their paper into a conference. So for a lot of reasons, uh, models that you find out there that you might wanna use, or even your own models might not be reproducible. Um, so before we talk about how to make our models reproducible, I just want to show you that uh, there is uh, uh, the scale of this reproducibility crisis. So Nature surveyed uh, machine learning engineers uh, and they asked them, have you ever tried to um, and failed to reproduce an experiment? And I don't know how many, it sounds like you guys have trained um, some models. So I would love to hear from you guys. Have you ever tried? Um, and fail to reproduce your own experiments, maybe? Feel free to drop it in the chat, a yes or no. Yeah, Carlos has tried and failed to reproduce. Oh, so Carlos, were you able to reproduce the results of your experiment, but they, it was hard to do so? Yeah, so... Carlos, okay. feel free to unmute and speak if you'd like. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, was this model data set actually when I was in, uh, as a tutor, as a mentor on Coursera, we are talking about and discussing about how reproducible it's important, but it's also expensive. And sometimes you don't have the, the data, the, the same data. So you're going to get closer as possible, but not exactly the same. Exactly. Um, Kartik said, uh, I failed until I submitted a GitHub issue. You know, that's going to be a lot of your career. I'm sorry to tell you that now, but uh, it's really bad. So here are some of the results that Nature found. Over 60% of the people across different fields fail to reproduce someone else's experiment and over 50% can't even reproduce their own experiment, which is like insane, right? And here you can see um, some of the reasons are uh, because there was pressure to publish really quickly, so they didn't have a chance to track everything or they didn't analyze their results. There wasn't enough code available. There wasn't the raw data available, like you guys said. So, Lavin, so then, question. sorry to interrupt. Yeah. 
one of my yeah. colleagues, Yawal, asked me about this. So the reproducibility versus replicability, right? In science, they distinguish between the two. A lot of the mm -hmm. replication crisis in science has been around for a while, especially in social yeah. sciences where they studied on a tiny sample in some niche part of the world, and then it doesn't translate to even other parts of the same country, for example. So yeah. in science is the crisis you're seeing both replication on re reproducibility and uh, for, from the ML life cycle standpoint, does weights and biases target reproducibility or is it also interested in like replication? Both. Uh, so replication, I'm guessing you mean like generalization beyond like the data right. that you saw. Right. So the same experimental setup, the same hypotheses and all of that, but on a totally different population that provides the data. Yeah, um, so both of those crises we see in the real world and like replication, you can like forgive maybe a little bit. Ideally, you can replicate if you're going to another population, but the uh, conditions are even more dire because you can't even produce reproduce the same experiment on the same population that you trained on, you know, which is why it's insane. And yeah, weights and biases definitely helps with both because um, you can track your entire model and you can see, uh, I'll show you in a little bit when I show you tables, you can see where your model is generalizing, where it's not, and then really dig into the predictions. Um, so I'll remember to cover that. Um, so uh, yeah, so Nature also asked like, uh, do you have a process for making your models reproducible in 34%? And you know, I don't believe this number at all because I believe, I think it's more than 34% of the researchers who have no process for um, ensuring that uh, if someone can reproduce their models, they were just maybe shy to like, you know, self-report this. But um, there is definitely a reproducibility crisis. 52% of the researchers believe that there's a significant crisis and 90% believe that there's a little bit of a crisis, you know? Uh, and I'm hoping by the end of this presentation, I not only tell, like convince you that you need to track everything about your models, but also give you the tools to do that. Um, this is literally like, you know, back in 2002 or 2005, people were um, writing code without using GitHub, you know, and no one thought it was a problem. You know, everyone had their own little folder where they uh, stored their code. But like now you would never uh, like write code without putting it on GitHub and versioning it. I think it's the same thing is going to happen to machine learning models. And oh, we're yeah. just one more thing yeah. Lavanya, I wanted to add, I put a link on the chat for the students to look at. This is a famous survey of Neurips and Eichler authors just two years ago. So these are like people at the very cutting edge of machine learning and deep learning. And if you look at the, some of the questions, this is a fascinating question because I work a lot on in my group on systems for large scale deep learning, reproducibility of hyperparameter optimization and stuff like that. Almost half the respondents do manual hyperparameter optimization. They just randomly pick ad hoc values here and there. They even have a yeah. heard of term called graduate student descent. And oh, yeah. This is especially true in deep learning because there's so many, there are gazillion hyperparameters and there is no systematic way that they do it. They just do it in an ad hoc way just to get the paper out. So this is even cutting edge deep learning researchers are doing this sort of stuff. So it's a real crisis. That is crazy, right? Okay, this makes it, I'll cover our hyperparameter sweeps. Like we literally let you pass a dictionary of min max values and then it just does it for you. So I'll also cover that. Um, so, you know, reproducibility is essentially like just like brushing your teeth. The more you do it, the better you get at it. Uh, and you wouldn't miss, hopefully you wouldn't miss uh, brushing your teeth in the morning. You should never train a model without being able to reproduce the results. Our tagline for the longest time used to be those who don't track their training are bound to repeat it. And I think it's like just so cool. Um, so, yeah. Next, let's just talk about really quickly, what does it mean to make your model reproducible? And again, if you guys start doing it today, you're going to be way ahead of the curve because, you know, uh, like you said, like most people are so far behind. They're not uh, tracking models. Um, sounds like they're not even doing hyperparameter search, right? Um, <clears throat> which is very concerning. So this is... Um, Part one of what Joelle says, uh, you should track about your model. Now you probably don't wanna track all of these things for every single model. It depends on when you're putting your models in production. So when you're just iterating on your model, you still wanna at least describe the algorithm and your assumptions. You wanna track the data set just for debugging purposes. You know, you wanna see where, how you split your train test 
um, data and like uh, you want to talk a little bit about how the data was collected, what data went into which model, you know, so uh, because this will help you debug the models. But once you're putting models in production, you need to um, ideally uh, be able to track all of these things like the training code, the pre-trained models, the range of hyperparameters, you know, uh, a, a description of the computing infrastructure that you used and so on. So <clears throat> this sounds like a lot, right? Um, how like, uh, and like you probably don't want to spend all of your time on tracking all of this. It sounds like a lot of work. You just want to train your models, make them a soda, publish a paper. So, uh, that's where weights and biases comes in. Uh, we automate this entire tracking process for you, and you just put a couple lines of code, and it just uh, capture, it picks up every single thing about your model and puts it in a nice little dashboard so you can do analysis on top. So I'll just walk you through uh, what weights and biases does. So, you know, for software, you um, like here you can see uh, <clears throat> what the software development pipeline looks like, and like for each step, there is a massive company that exists that is focused on that step of the pipeline. Because model training is so early, uh, most of these um, steps don't have a, a big company that is designed to uh, you know, help, help you with that step. Weights and Biases is hoping to be able to be the tool that is the central dashboard where you and your colleagues can just like put your models and then forget about them. And then a couple months later, if you if your boss asks you, oh, what did we try? Well, you know, this one time we tried this thing and it led to really good results on this one class. Can you pull it back up? You can just go and pull it back up. So <clears throat> this is the world that you might be familiar with today. So you train a model, it spits out a bunch of metrics. Um, if you're being really diligent, you put it in an Excel spreadsheet, the last values, the final values of the model, then uh, you pick your favorite models, and then you pick a couple hyperparameters about them, you put them in a paper, publish, done. There's no way anyone can come in and reproduce uh, your model just based on this. There's no way you can go back and debug your models based on this. So this is what weights and biases looks like. And I will, at this point, give you guys a little bit of a demo. So first of all, let's talk about one model, right? What can we track about one model? So here uh, you can see uh, this is one model that's been tracked in weights and biases. You can see who trained the model, when it was trained. You can see the exact set of GitHub commands that you need to run to reproduce this particular iteration of the model. You can see um, all of the hyperparameters that you trained and anything else about the model that you logged. You can see um, all of the metrics, so here we're uh, uh, comparing a bunch of accuracies, bunch of loss to check for overfitting and so on. You can track any metric. You can see the GPU and CPU utilization because you know no, none of us except Google have unlimited compute. So we really wanna be careful about how much compute we, if we are using, especially if you're deploying your models in a constricted environment, you do care about how uh, much your model, like both for inference and for training, how many, many GPU resources it takes. We also have uh, we store logs just in case there was an error that you wanna search back through. And this is not obvious, but like we stored the exact requirements.txt so you can recreate the exact environment that this particular model was trained on. So that was one model. We do this for every single model that you're training. <clears throat> so here, every single run, this 398 of them is a model. Um, and if I click into any one of them, it'll take me here to this page. So now, uh, once I start tracking all of the hyperparameters and all of the metrics and everything about my model, I can start doing really fun things, right? So I can uh, start doing analysis. So I can say I care about car accuracy or accuracy, whatever. And it will tell me for, if you're optimizing for car accuracy, so for positive, uh, so uh, the number of training examples is positively correlated to um, accuracy, which is obvious, right? But what's less obvious is like, so if you use uh, AlexNet as the encoder, that is going to lead to that's going to be negatively correlated to higher values of accuracy. So right away, I know not to use AlexNet in future experiments, you know, and instead, um, uh, ResNet 34 was the one that worked out better. The other thing is, as your colleagues are training models, you can see the metrics coming in live here, 
and you can see all of the model metrics in one place. So we've gone from a world where um, for a single model, it was a text file to a world where we can see all of the model plots in one line, uh, sorry, in one plot. And I can add more than one metric and start like comparing things. And then I have this parallel coordinates plot. Um, so I can just be like, okay, for the lowest value of training loss, what were the hyperparameters that, you know, um, and the values of learning rate and so on that were um, the most optimal. And then I can just reduce the self, uh, the search space dramatically. And um, even if you're doing graduate student dis, uh, descent, you know, which is like you're manually putting in numbers, this at least helps you uh, try, um, be reasonable about what values to try next. You're not just randomly doing it. But we also have a product called Sweeps that lets you just, like I said, uh, define a dictionary and train a whole bunch, like try uh, hyperparameter values from a whole bunch of different distributions. I can also, um, so these plots are responsive, which is why they're loading. Um, here, I can also see model prediction. So if I'm training a self-driving car, I can be like, okay, how has my model improved over time? Um, you can see this is the ground truth and this is how the model is predicting. So you can see it's not good enough yet to detect uh, street lights and so on. So it gives you a lot of like uh, data about what kind of model you're training and how you might go about debugging it. You can also compare which model. It's not just about the most accurate or the most performant model. It's also about the most efficient model. So you can uh, compare models um, with, on their GPU metrics here. So that's, these are just some of the things that you can track. Um, the other things you can do is the moment you have an insight, <clears throat> you can go and create reports. Let me just turn admin mode on. This is my colleague's project. Okay, so now um, if I suppose, uh, I already captured one insight here, right? I realized that AlexNet is negatively correlated and uh, ResNet is positively correlated. So I could go and create a report and then I could put these panels in there. So for example, OpenAI, before they train any model, they have to write a report with a hypothesis. So they go, and they do it before they train a model. So they will like, hypothesis, this batch size works really well, whatever, you know? Or like, you can also create a report afterwards and be like, AlexNet was better uh, than this and so on. So you just put your text in there. Um, you can add all sorts of markdown. It's like Notion, you know, and then you can just save this insight and then you can send it to a colleague. And then, or even if you don't send it to a colleague, uh, you have notes of your model training progress throughout. Um, and what this lets you do is, you know, either capture one liner insights or over time, you can start cleaning them up. So here, Stacy has written a report that compares different batch sizes um, and uh, numbers of GPUs and sees the effect of them on model performance, you know? So this is something um, that you would share with your team, with your manager, and then they can, you know, go and like debug uh, and like, or like dive deeper into your model training results. This is also great for classes. So you can uh, submit assignments um, as this and share it with your professor and they can just go and uh, really quickly see how your model did. Um, you can also then progressively start cleaning up these reports and maybe you can already see where I'm going with this, but like this is something you might present at a board meeting or you might publish as a blog post. So like now this is very cleaned up. The markdown is really clean. This code in there, like there's still plots in there. And so uh, here's one example. This is another example. So, you know, uh, you can really clean up um, and put model uh, like explorations within your blog post. So these are like distill.pub like reports, you know, and you can like uh, run an uh, analysis after having your model. So you can set the thresholds for your bounding boxes. You can hide certain bounding boxes and it just changes things. So once you have that, you, the next step is we have this thing called uh, fully connected. So if you go to wandb.ai slash fc, this is also a great resource to learn about new techniques um, and see how people are building models in the real world. So fully connected, you, if you have a cleaned up blog post, you can go and publish it here. You can see <clears throat> people are talking about GPT-3, people are talking about how to use, um, uh, like how to build medical models, uh, you know, transfer learning. There's all sorts of different um, 
types of reports that people write. And what we're trying to build with Fully Connected is a knowledge base of intermediate to advanced tutorials, you know, because I feel like schools and other resources do such a great job of giving you those fundamentals. But then, um, you know, you're kind of left on your own, especially because our field moves so fast. It's really hard to find good tutorials on intermediate uh, topics. So that's what Fully Connected is for. And um, so uh, that was the natural evolution of reports from like these little, tiny little things to fully fledged blog posts. So Lavanya, this yeah. is spectacular. Thank you for the lovely demo. I think that uh, shows some of the advanced features of uh, weights and biases. This is terrific to look at. Um, there are a couple of questions on the chat. I also wanted to have a question here. So in the, um, it, this sounds like weights and biases is now a end-to-end -end kind of thing, not just from training and tweaking models all the way to reporting. So like in yeah. the BI world, so this is sort of like BI for AI, right? So in the BI world, like Tableau's and all these companies started saying, tweaking your SQL queries, you have all these parameters, like a group I or what average are you doing or whatever. And then you publish visualizations, you go to reporting. Here you're doing something analogous where you have hyperparameters, you have architectures, and then end-to-end -end pipelines, you can all the way go to reporting. This is pretty cool. Um, so do you see this space evolving in that sort of a direction? This is sort of like BI for AI? Exactly. So um, our we, every marketing uh, person I talk to really wants to call it BI for AI. Is it's that right? <laughs> Yeah. And like okay. that exactly that, that is like the three word explanation for what we're doing. Um, sorry, uh, do I have more time? Because I have more stuff that I want to. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. We can, we oh, can yeah. take the questions. Later. So I do have questions from some students on the chat there. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll do a questions first. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure I'm not out of time because I do want to blow your guys' mind away with a couple so, more things. Yeah. Ian uh, asks, is, why is there a reproducibility crisis now? What changed from 20 years ago? That's a great question. So specifically in machine learning, because we have so much more data now, we have so much more compute now that uh, we are able to apply AI to problems that matter. And that's when reproducibility becomes important, right? If you're just trying to hit soda, reproducibility is not as important. But like if you're making decisions about who goes to jail, then you need to know, um, you need to be able to reproduce your models. Um, so it's just like, AI, uh, machine learning and deep learning is being used in real world applications. And also it was easier to reproduce with traditional machine learning because like there weren't as many hyperparameters to tune. It was mostly you needed to put the right data in the right model and then you would for the most part get the same uh, result, you know? But with deep learning because of, the, because of some of the reasons I talked about and the nature of GPUs, the same model is, uh, the result is slightly different depending on small things. So it has introduced new variations that didn't exist in the traditional machine learning world. <clears throat> Thank you, Avani. We can continue. Yeah, I can take the question about TensorFlow. That's one of my favorite things to talk about. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> Prashant asks, can you talk about the differences in the product from something like TensorFlow? Yeah, so I'll say uh, a couple of things. Uh, that we in our docs we have a whole section about how weights and biases are superior to or the like different. I can say superior. I work for WNB. Um, uh, superior to uh, TensorFlow, and it's because if you try to do anything real with TensorFlow, as in like if you try to scale it, uh, we call uh, weights and biases TensorFlow at scale. Because um, for training one model, TensorFlow is great to see how your model performed and like being able to see the plots. The moment you're trying to like either compare models or do it in the cloud and save it forever and do multiplayer machine learning so your colleagues can see how your models are doing, it's just such a bad experience, you know? We're TensorFlow in the cloud uh, that is scalable. And we have all of these other features that I will talk about in a sec. So it's like, like you said, end to end, uh, model training and model reproducibility and debugging. Okay. And Wait, so on, on, the, on, that, on that note, Lavanya, is there a standardization of the ontology for what needs to be tracked? Because different tools like TensorBoard or weights and biases or something else will track different things, especially in deep learning as the even the vocabulary of hyperparameters is evolving, right? Like dropout wasn't there early on, but then it added up later. So is there an ontology that the industry is agreeing upon or what do you think about that? 
Yeah, for reproducibility. So um, is the question like, what should we be tracking to call a model reproducible? Yeah, so I just posted the source for this. So this is like from Joel, who's the reproducibility chair at NeurIPS. There's a reproducibility workshop every single year at NeurIPS, and I would highly recommend checking that out. There's probably recordings of that from the last year, um, and not much has changed, but like, this is like uh, the end all be all um, checklist. Got it. Thank you. OK, let's continue. Cool. And again, like this is still evolving. We're in the very, very uh, Jeff Bezos likes to say, like, we're still in day zero. We haven't even left the, the car hasn't even left the parking lot yet. That's deaf. If it's true of Amazon, it's definitely true of machine learning. You guys are going to be the people who help figure out the answers to these questions and build these, uh, you know, workflows, what best in class workflows look like. So it's like a really exciting time. Um, Okay, cool. Uh, I will check out the survey later. Uh, the next thing that I want to talk about. So, so far we've talked about taking models themselves and everything that it takes to debug them and reproduce them, right? Uh, next, I want to talk about the data in the entire pipeline. So, you know, uh, weights and biases lets you track and um, some of our customers, any customer who's regulated loves this feature because we uh, let you track all the data uh, like the entire pipeline, basically. So you started with raw data, you did some pre-processing, you got to uh, uh, an intermediate state, you split the data into training and validation. You guys must be bored to that of hearing about this. Uh, and then you train a bunch of models and then uh, you uh, do inference on it and then you pick a model, right? Uh, in the real world, this is slightly more complicated. So uh, this is still a very contained version of what a real world pipeline might look like. But like every single step is tracked with weights and biases. So for example, um, like um, Blue Cross Blue Shield won't put models in production, can't put models in production because regulators need to see every single thing. They wanna see data provenance, <clears throat> uh, what uh, data went into each model, was there personally identifiable data? Can you prove that you actually removed it? You know, and so on. So uh, for that, you need to be able to see what data went into each step. <clears throat> That's a great question. So the circles are um, scripts for the most part process um, uh, jobs, and then the um, <clears throat> squares are artifacts. So uh, an artifact is either input or output. So a data set can be an input artifact, a model that comes out is an output artifact, and then the circles are just the transformations that you're doing on it. Great question. So, uh, and then you can have all sorts of things like versioning and like metadata. What I do want to talk about though um, is tables. So right now we just saw the pipeline, but tables, and uh, I will actually drop this uh, in here just in case you want to read it. <clears throat> so tables is one of my favorite features. It's a very new feature that we've launched. And what they let you do is think of them like a pandas data frame with a SQL language built on top. So what that essentially lets you do is you can either take the data set that you train the model on, or you can take the model predictions, and then you can start doing really interesting operations on top. So for example, um, here uh, we have uh, all of our model predictions. We're grouping it by the truth value, and then we're seeing what our model um, predicted, right? So right away, you can see for the Amphibia class, uh, the model thinks it's Mollusca for uh, a lot of examples. And here you can see all of the different examples. You can like, uh, see the score, you can create derived metrics, but then you can click here and you can start doing operations. So you can drop uh, nulls, you can like, you know, combine columns and so on. <clears throat> so now what this lets you do, here we're doing the same thing by what did a model guess? What was the truth value? Um, and then well, now what we can start doing is we can start comparing models. So in this, sorry, my internet is absolute crap. I'm in a hotel. Um, so here we train two models and now we're comparing uh, which, uh, how each model does on each of the classes. So if this was a self-driving car example, 
um, you could see which of your models are really good at detecting um, street lights, which are really good at detecting cars and so on, you know? And then you uh, ideally want to ensemble models like who are uh, good at different things. And then you can even see how the ensemble does compared to the other models, you know? So this type of analysis is super important before you put your model in production. And then you can do like a whole bunch of other types of uh, visualizations with um, tables. Uh, <clears throat> So this becomes now even more end to end, you know, um, and something uh, there's so much coming and that I can't talk about right now, but um, these panels are only going to get more powerful, you know, your model uh, training pipeline is only going to get more modular, you know, so you'll almost be able to like um, treat it like a building block, take any data set take any model and weave together the model training pipelines and then analyze them in different ways. So it's going to be exciting. Uh, cool. Uh, so uh, I also, I think that was mostly what it, I wanted to cover. I didn't uh, go through my slides, but essentially um, I can send this deck later. This just covers everything that I just oh, talked about. Okay, sure. So we it, do have some, we do have 20 minutes left, so. Oh, uh, yeah, but like these slides are basically everything that I did as okay. a demo. It's just exciting. Sounds great. So, yeah, you can send me the slide deck later. I can send it to the, I upload it on Canvas on the of course home page. Thank you. Perfect. And then the one thing that I do want to leave you with is like, we run a ton of events. Um, like, we're always running events and we, um, would love for you guys to come to the events. We would love for you to write these reports, you know, and we would love to publish them, tweet about them. The people who read these uh, blog posts are our users and almost every big company is using us. So like, you know, you get in front of that kind of machine learning engineer if you publish on here. And like, if you need absolutely anything from me, feel free to reach out to me at Levani at 1DB. And if you also want to CC my chief of staff, she can get you sorted. That's it. Great, thank you, Lavanya. Yeah, I'll I'm saving the chat as well, students. I will post on Piazza later. This is a this this blog post thing is actually really cool because we do teach students the importance of getting your visualizations and your story and communication, communicating a story with your data right. And we have a capstone project where they all do it in their final year. And this could be a great way for them to do a presentation of some sort with that. Exactly. Um on that note, I would love to show you guys, this is like uh, how important blog posts are. I got my current job because I wrote this one blog post. Um, da, da, da. So, you know, like we were all like um, learning uh, machine learning at some point. Uh, once uh, I, after I had learned it, I didn't want to do a regular capstone uh, project, you know, to showcase my skills. So I just took a data set from CERN's uh, LHC. Um, and like, I, it was also my excuse to learn particle physics, you know, and a little bit about dark matter. And then just like wrote this whole thing on like, you know, a little bit about like what the LHC does, all the, uh, an introduction to standard model um, uh, of physics, and then just like trained a machine learning uh, model, trained a bunch of machine learning models, not just like deep learning, but other ones. And like uh, our CEO saw this uh, blog post and like, um, you know, was like, oh, you should come work here. So blog posts like definitely matter a lot. Great, thank you, Lavanya. I have a, I see a question on the chat from Carlos again. Can this tool connect to Tableau? It's not, it cannot, cause it doesn't have to, cause we have a lot of the analytics um, like uh, capabilities that Tableau has, but this is built from the ground up for deep learning. So like we have the notion of like, you know, in deep learning, uh, there are steps and you spit out values at different steps. And then, you know, you can do certain types of analyses on top. So all of that is built in. And if you click on edit panel, then it gives you a bunch of different like um, analysis tools that I won't even have time to go into, but like it's pretty sophisticated, so we don't connect to Tableau. But if there is a feature mi missing, reach out to me and I'll make sure we get it built. On, related to that, um, there are people who are now using tools like um, MLflow for reproducibility. MLflow in particular seems to have gained a lot of popularity. I spoke with Mate recently when he visited my graduate yeah. version of this class and um, 
they have this notion of projects and it's more generic. It's not tied to a particular ML tool or something like that. So I assume MLflow, whatever data they save, metadata they save, I assume you can connect it with the agent biases to visualize it and analyze it, right? Yeah, so we love MLflow and like we have an MLflow integration somewhere that you can find if you search for the docs and it just slips up the data, you know, uh, yeah. Um, okay. And okay. essentially, you could log anything in weights and biases because you could literally go one db dot log and like any time series data and like it'll just like start plotting it and then you know you can set config so you could track uh, stock prices in it and anything that like moves over time you could track. Got it. Okay. Okay. Do you have more stuff to cover or should we take more questions from the students? Yeah, let's take more questions. I'm done. Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. <laughs> So let's give Lavani a round of applause and we'll keep asking questions. Um, I'm gonna clap, but everyone's probably clapping virtually. <laughs> Thank you for the excellent demo and for the talk, Lavani. Um, okay. Students, more questions. Feel free to post on chat or unmute and speak or anyone else in the audience. Uh, I have another question. Um, what is the learning curve to, to learn this, this tool? Like I just took a look on the website, there's a tutorial. Mm -hmm. And beside of that, there's any, uh, the company offers some like short videos on YouTube, something like that. Yeah, so we've got a little bit of everything, no matter what your learning style. Let me just pull up the, our YouTube channel really fast. And then I'll walk you through a couple of things that we have. So, okay. So we have um, our YouTube channel where we do four events a week. So if you go in here, you'll be able to see an insane number of talks. Uh, we, um, have a play, uh, we have a podcast where like, you know, people who are building uh, cutting edge things with, uh, uh, with deep learning come and talk about those. We have study groups for all sorts of different frameworks. We have Kaggle talks if you wanna get into that. PyTorch study group is really good too. But we also have weights and biases, learning to use weights and biases, that's the playlist and I'll drop it in the chat. And it, that helps you learn um, how to use WMB. There's also weights and biases tutorials. I don't know why we have two of them. Uh, the best place is the docs um, uh, where you can go and see how to get started with experiment tracking. It's actually not um, really hard because like essentially all you have to do is uh, a quick start. Here it is. Um, so you just install weights and biases you log in and then you import 1db in your script. Um, and then you just initialize a project, uh, which is uh, whatever model you wanna train. And then you can just start logging things. So uh, for every framework that you wanna use, we already have an integration where you just have to add one or two lines of code and it just automatically picks up all of the things about that model. But you can also do it manually by just doing 1db.log and then over um, in your training script, just track all the metrics. Um, so it's, essentially oops it's essentially as simple as that what happened okay um it's as, as simple as installing 1db logging in setting a project and then you just start logging anything the uh, then you can get more fancy so you can use 1db.config and then set all sorts of hyperparameters and hyperparameters is what you do analysis on so you do want to track as many of them as possible you can also then get fancy and be like if my model accuracy drops below something send me an alert and then get uh, started with like more of the product. Also, when you do sign up, it'll take you to a very nice quick start page that'll walk you through the three or four lines of code that you need to copy into your code. So it should take care of itself as you're onboarding. So I have a couple of questions for you, Lavinia. So one is on scalability. So the notion of scale that you're using here is really teams and collaboration and number of models you're building and so on. The axis of scalability that I'm curious about is model size, especially with uh, transformers nowadays and hugging phase and stuff like that. Each model itself is few gigabytes and now you're doing hyperparameter search and architecture tuning and stuff. You end up with hundreds of gigabytes of model data. And does weights and biases scale with uh, say the analytics that you need to do on the hyperparameters and the statistics and the inference and stuff? Yeah, uh, so a bunch of our customers are saving 
millions of models like and like open ai trained their hand you know the uh, hand that they had and like so they stored images and videos and god knows what not in there you know and like it totally scaled and if it's good enough to train that hand which is a video heavy problem resource heavy problem um it's like we spend a lot of time on scalability and it can handle as much data as you throw at it um and then also uh, in terms of cost it's completely free for all academics forever the whole feature no matter how much data you want to store um you know so uh, go ahead and store all that you need to you're only uh, uh, limited by your ISP, I guess. Um, so that makes me curious. What is the backend for weights and biases? How does it scale? Does it use like a Dask or something like that? It uses Go. Oh, you've written an entire backend in Go, your own yeah. custom file system based backend in Go. Uh, that I don't know, but I just know our backend is in Go. So I'm like a machine learning engineer, so I don't know much about it. <laughs> okay, no worries. I was just curious about the scalability. Okay. The second question yeah. I have is upstream part of the ML workflow before the data set is created, people play around with feature engineering, feature selection, data transformation, data preparation and cleaning and stuff like that. And a lot of that part of the workflow today is a hot mess, even bigger mess than probably the model tuning and model building reproducibility crisis. That one is an even documentation crisis. It's, yeah. I've heard from practitioners that often people edit files in their data frames and Excel sheets, and it's not documented, it's not reproducible, it's not governed, it's not audited. Do you think weights and biases can help in that sort of scenario in the future? How do you envision that happening? Yeah, I think it can help with it today. So like, you know, you can have like, you start with your raw data and each transformation that you do, ideally you just like log into weights and biases. And then each of these data sets comes with like metadata and so on. So if I click into any of them, you can like, we just have three tags, but then you could tag it with like, this is a transformation that I did in this one, then this happened, then this happened, you know? And then uh, instead of having a text log, you have like your actual like uh, graph and you can click into anything and see what transformation was made. Got it. So you'd have to materialize all the transformations and then save those different data files in the workflow graph. Got it. Okay. Yeah, like, as you're doing it, you just like, um, just uh, want to be dot log artifact and it just and pass it the file name and then any uh, tags configs for the data set and then you can do operations on top you can even store your data set you know and then uh, use tables to do fun uh, digging in got it so is it one db or sorry is it one db or wnb i've heard you pronounce it both ways <laughs> You know, that's a great question. We ran a poll, 600 people voted on it. Um, uh, I get very confused myself. The uh, official uh, way to say it is 1B, like the one symbol and the B. Um, and like we're coming up with a merch store, we're coming up with a bunch of merch uh, that is like has B symbolism. I even have a B necklace here and like once. Um, initially, uh, when we were just like 10 people, we got into the habit, the bad habit of calling it 1DB because it's technically a database for your models. We're trying to move away from that. Yeah. <laughs> I think the name 1DB is sticky. It's a good, you're going to have a tough time moving away from 1DB because I saw beeps everywhere, you know, that's my thing. That's why I'm trying to change it to 1B, but yeah. Right. It's a common naming scheme in the database world for various sorts of DBMSs. We've had model yeah. DB, we had time scale DB, we have X DB, okay. so many, it's like so many DBs. So it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay, more questions from the students. Oh, I see a question from Akshay. Does this work for hyperparameter optimization frameworks such as Optuna? Uh, it does indeed. We have an Optuna integration that you can go and learn more about. We don't have uh, it in the docs. Uh, you know, every time I give these talks, I find like three things to go and tell my team to do. So Optuna docs are hard to find here, but we do have an integration with them. But uh, if you want to do sweep uh, hyperparameter optimization, uh, I will show you. So if you go to hyperparameter uh, tuning, there's a really nice tutorial. Uh, there's also a quick start. Uh, I'll just walk you through it super fast. So essentially, uh, you do the config uh, initialization you set the configs as we did before, then you just have this little YAML file where you can say like, you know, for um, this type, uh, for learning rate, min and max, this is the type of distribution that I want you to pull it from. You can even give it discrete values for things like optimizers, and then uh, what metric you want to do, whether you want to maximize, minimize it, and then methods is where it gets interesting. So you can do your regular 
grid search, random search, you can do Bayesian search, but then we also have through Raytune really sophisticated algorithms. Uh, so like Hyperopt and all of those are supported. So you can just do sweeps. Um, so sweeps is our word for hyperparameter, uh, hyperparameter tuning, but you can do that with just like defining this YAML file. Okay, great. So any other questions? I have one more question, I'm sorry. <laughs> Model deployment aspect. So this lifecycle covers all the way from what the data scientist is doing. Uh, then for deployment, typically what ends up happening in the MLOps world is they hand it off to an MLOps person or a DevOps person or something like that. And that area is a hot mess right now. And there's a tons of startups trying to automate and optimize and whatnot. What is your take on that? Do you think weights and biases with its unified view of the artifacts and the metadata and stuff can play a role there in the future? Yeah. So that uh, production monitoring is coming. It's one of our most hotly requested features. Um, we hope to launch it this year. Uh, and the reason we started early in the pipeline is like, uh, if you have the uh, model training data, it's easy to make an ask and be like, okay, you already found the best model here. Now go and one click, go deploy it, and then just measure how it's doing, the concept drift and all of that stuff. And then like, you know, and then you come back because like, if there's a problem there, then you'll have to come back and like, tweak the data set, tweak the model, everything that we're already capturing. So it just made sense to start here first, but production monitoring is coming soon. Great, sounds exciting. Yeah, looking forward to it. Um, any other questions from the students or the audience? This is this is great. I mean, I've heard a lot of weights and biases. We've used TensorBoard and now I think we'll also start using weights and biases. It's great that it's free and uh, is it all, isn't it also open source? Like parts of it is open source too, right? So our entire client library is open source. It's not completely open source, but like the client libraries, you can make PRs, everything. Um, yes. On the TensorBoard note, so Hugging Face did this really nice um, hackathon and like there was TensorBoard in uh, the OG code that they gave out. People literally were so frustrated and they like all like, you know, switched to weights and biases. So trust me, uh, night and day in terms of user experience. Okay. Sounds good. Great. Um, if there are no other questions, oh, uh, thank you again, Lavanya, for walking us through this whole thing. And uh, let's hope the reproducibility crisis starts to abate. I know the conferences at least have started acting on it. All the NLP conferences, the top tier ones, ACL, MNLP, are demanding a reproducibility log. Like, what are the hyperparameter tuning that you've done? What are the architectures you've compared? Whereas in the past, people would just bury that information and not even publish it. And KDD used to have that before. I think many of the other venues in the data science world are starting to demand this now. Certainly, Sigma VLDB, for example, database venues do value reproducibility. They even have a badge and stuff like that. And hopefully in the future, at least from the research world, it becomes a more serious thing. And tools like this will help people reduce the grunt work they need to do and not fear having to do this work because it's so much easier. And you guys are the, uh, like your class is the generation which is gonna help uh, put reproducibility in model training workflows. It's exciting solve to you guys. That's great. Yes, so students, we're looking forward to what you will accomplish. <laughs> okay, thank you all. And thank you again for visiting us, Lavanya, and for the great talk. Thank you guys for having me. Okay, um, let me save the chat now <laughs> and I will post it on uh, the uh, Piazza. Okay, take care everyone.